Oh, welcome. This is Jacob Williams. Um, I know you requested my guide to GCSE English. I hope you found it helpful to go through that. But in this video, I want to give you some more help by actually breaking down all the different topics. And I'm going to show you um, in, in just half an hour some of the key methods that you can use in all of these topics to make the process as simple and easy as possible. So we have got to do, in you have got to do rather, in your English GCSE, all of these topics. So analyzing language. Now, the, the question numbers depend on your, your exam board. And actually, I work with students doing all exam boards. It doesn't really matter which one you're doing. They're more similar than you think. And one of the myths people say is that, well, there's no point learning something for a different exam board. It's not true. They're 90% the same. There's differences in the style of the questions, but they're looking for the same skills. And because people usually don't understand that English is about skills, they don't understand this point. That if you learn the skill of analysing, you can do any of the exams. You get a grade 9 in AQA at Excel, Educas or OCR or the IGCSE. It doesn't make any difference if you know how to analyse. Yes, you need to learn the techniques for each question, but even those are not that different. So I'm going to show you the skills today. Now, the first skill you have to learn in GCSE English is analysing language. Okay. Analyzing is explaining and breaking down. It's basically saying why and how, okay? It's saying why and how. Now, language is words. That's simple enough, isn't it? So it's why and how words create effects in the reader. So to analyze language, this is something you won't learn anywhere else, as far as I know. What you need to do to do this effectively is to actually explain why the writer chose one word when they could have used others. So you need a quote, but then you, you go into one word. So what you do is you zoom in to one word from the quote you chose. And then you explain, in fact, you, you would, and you wouldn't do this in your answer, but in your plan, or do it while you're practicing, and eventually it becomes automatic and you don't need to do it anymore, but you can actually make a list of other words they could have used instead. And then you explain why the writer chose the word they did instead of the other words. Why did the writer say shuddering when they could have said shaking? Or shivering, for example, right? Shuddering is onomatopoeia. It sounds like the thing you're doing of shuddering. So is that why? To make that more vivid sensory image that engages, engages your sense of feeling as well as what you see, for example. Okay, so that's what we have to do when we're analysing language. Now, next thing is analysing structure. So what is structure? Well, it isn't language. What is it? Structure is, and again, it's analysing, which means why and how, it's why and how the order of events in the text affects the reader. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it means that if the stuff that happens at the end of the text was moved to the beginning, your reaction would have been different. So during the time that you're reading a text, you learn new things, your thoughts and feelings change. You start out feeling one way about a character, about the plot in the first part. In the middle, you feel different. In the end, you feel different again. Structure is essentially about this. The beginning, the middle, and the end. And guess what? They go in that order. Start with the beginning, then the middle, then the end. Write about them in that order too. And you say, how do we feel in the beginning? How do we feel in the middle? How do we feel in the end? You give a reason, and that's all that structure is. And following that method makes it very easy and simple. Number three. Evaluating views of texts. Now, I'm going to tell you a method here that we can use for most types of question. And you actually use it in, I'm going to put all the ones where we use this method in blue. Okay, We use it in evaluating. We use it in analysing structure. We use it in analysing language. We also use it when we are doing literature. Um, I'm going to leave poetry for a second, but we use it in these. Shakespeare, which might be, for example, Macbeth, or, a, sorry, or Romeo and Juliet. We use it in the 19th century novel, which might be A Christmas Carol, or Jekyll and Hyde. And we use it in the modern text, which might be An Inspector Calls, or possibly any other text, like... Blood Brothers, or Animal Farm, or Lord of the Flies, but most of you do an Inspector course. So we use it in most areas of literature. Now, the method is called Peter. Okay, so 
let me get this thing completely clear for you. Your school may tell you to use peel, petal, just about anything. P-E-E -E even, P-E-A, piece even, I've seen. Pestle is another one. Now, that's fine. Now, it, some teachers are great, right? And some teachers will say, well, I'm going to mark this how an examiner would and just look for how well you have answered the question. And I don't really care which structure you use, but I'm going to teach you one because I think it helps. Some teachers are annoying. Some teachers actually just say, well, you've got to do precisely what I told you to do. You've got to use pestle if I told you to use pestle. You've got to use P if I told you to use P. I don't agree with that approach. I don't care which one you use if you write a good answer. But if you're watching this video, you're probably watching it because you want to write better answers than you're writing now and get better grades than you're getting now. Now, that is why I teach Peter. Peter is point, evidence, technique, explanation, and reader. So you know what a point is? Evidence is quotes. The reason that it includes technique and reader, now explanation, by the way, is analysis. The same thing. The reason it includes technique and reader is because very often students miss out on the technique part. The technique is what is the technique? Is it a simile? Is it a metaphor? Is it exaggeration? Is it something else? Sometimes there won't be a technique that's obvious, but you know what? There's always a technique because you could say the type of word. Nouns, verbs, adjectives. Easy. You learned that in primary school. You can do that as your technique. So, as long as you explain clearly the effect that it has, but don't miss out the technique, you have to use what examiners call subject terminology, even if it's something simple like a verb. It counts as subject terminology. You've got to use it. Okay, then we have the reader. Now, often students miss out on the reader. They just say, oh, the text um, shows this, or the text creates a feeling of this. But who does it create that feeling in? Well, guess what? It's the reader. That's why anyone writes everything. Um, nothing would be written by a writer if there wasn't a reader to read it. So, for the reader, you need to actually say, the reader will feel, like, what do they feel? The reader feels something. You could use this exact sentence starter. The reader feels, put it in, fill in the blank, the reader feels something about something. Most students miss this out. We don't just feel happy, we feel happy about something. About something, because of something. And here you link it back to the explanation. What was it in the text that made them feel happy or sad or angry or whatever? Okay, so if you can do that, your analysis is going to improve. But we also use it in evaluation. So what is evaluation? Well, evaluation is when you give an opinion. So in evaluation, you've got to debate an opinion. Do you agree with something or not? Do you think, for example, that the character is uh, stupid and careless or not? So when you're doing evaluation, you need to say both sides and then your own opinion. So first thing you do is you do Peter for why you agree, then you do Peter for why someone might disagree, and then you do your overall opinion, and you do more explanation, more analysis. Explain why one side is stronger. So that's evaluation. It's very similar to analysis, but you've got two sides, and then you give an overall opinion. The next thing is inference. Inference is... It's to do with non-fiction texts, like newspaper articles or autobiographies. And inference is when you work out information that they didn't tell you. So you work something out that wasn't said directly, but was suggested. How do we do that? Well, the best structure for inference is to use this. P-E-I, P-E-I-C. Uh, because the inference questions actually ask you about two text to make a comparison between the two to identify a similarity or difference in relation to a certain topic. This stands for point, evidence, inference, and then guess what? You do it again for the other text. Point, evidence, inference for text two. Then the C, you might guess, is your comparison. So you say overall how they're similar or different. Then we have comparing perspectives. Now, this one, we're going to use a version of Peter that is longer. P-E-T, E-T, E R. The second ET is evidence and technique again, because the first ET, if you're comparing, you're comparing two things. The first ET relates to the first text, and the second ET relates to the second text. So you do P, your overall point, which needs to relate to both texts, your explanation and technique, uh, sorry, evidence and technique from one text, then your evidence and technique from the other text, then you explain 
why that supports your point, then you link it to the reader. You can also use this in anything where you're comparing two texts, which often comes up in poetry, by the way. Okay, so that is comparing perspectives. Then we have creative writing. Now, a lot of students find it hard to come up with ideas for stories. They might say, oh, I'm not creative, I'm not imaginative. I'm not, I'm not imaginative. You don't need to be imaginative. You need to follow a method. Now, in creative writing, the best way to think of an idea is to think of the elements of a story. And the first one is when and where, which is called a setting. And all these words begin with W, which makes it very easy. The next one is who, which is a character. Who was involved in the story? And the next one is what. What do they do? What do the character do? And the character's got to do something in the story. And usually they have some kind of problem that they've got to solve, right? A plot is usually a problem which might also have a solution, but not always. There could be a bad ending and they don't solve the problem, but they're, they're going to try. And that's what a plot is about. And there's probably going to be another character, not always, but often there's an antagonist, you know, a bad person in the story too, who's causing the problem. There doesn't have to be. Um, you can write a great story with one character or two. More than two is pushing it because you don't have much time. And description and, and using techniques is more important than what actually happens in the story. I, I would really advise you, make your story boring in the sense that you should make it about something that happens in everyday life. Because you know about everyday life. You can think of ideas about everyday life, about school, relationships, homework parents, stuff you actually know about from normal life. Don't write about fantasy or science fiction, because you guess what you have to do? Explain backstory that no one really wants to read about and doesn't help you get marks. So you do the what, then you do the why, which is like the motivation of why it happened. But it's also why it matters, which is the last part of your story, by the way, which is called the resolution, which might be a solution solution from chemistry is when you dissolve something, right? Um, you know, dissolving your problem. Think about it that way. But a resolution doesn't necessarily do that. A resolution just means that it's an ending. It ends somehow, but you don't necessarily um, solve the problem. You might do, or you might not. Okay, and then finally, after the why, um, well, actually, after the why, you are pretty much done, because you've got everything you need. You've got a setting, you've got a character, you've got a plot, and you've got a resolution. Let's break this down into, into a few steps of what you actually do in your creative writing. The first thing that happens is you have background, and you can divide it into five sections. You need to write about six paragraphs, so one of these is going to be longer than the others, and I probably would make this the, the most important part. So the second part is the inciting incident, which is like a trigger. It's the first action that leads to the stuff in the story actually happening. Uh, like if you notice a haunted house and then you go to explore it, that's your inciting incident. Or you realise you lost your homework, that's your inciting incident. Okay, step three, rising action. Things are getting worse, so you're getting more and more nervous that your teacher is going to find out you've not done your homework. And step four is the climax, it's the big crisis or problem. That's when your teacher finds out and reacts to you, however they're going to react. And then step five is the resolution, which is the ending, right? How does it turn out? And most students kind of miss out this part, but it's the why in our story formula. If you don't have a why, the reader's left feeling unsatisfied. They're left feeling, well, that, okay, that was a story, something happened, but I don't know why I really care about it, though. So you need a resolution to show the reader how it turned out and how you feel and why they should care at the end of it all. So that's creative writing. It's a very simple formula if you break it down. Okay, next we have persuasive writing. So here you're trying to give your opinion on a statement and say why other people should agree with you. So persuasive writing. <clears throat> I'm going to say that here, there are three things you have to do. And I call them the rhetorical triangle. Rhetorical doesn't mean a question. You see, it's called a rhetorical question, which you probably heard of, right? A question where you, d you know the answer, but you're asking it for effect to make someone think. It's called a rhetorical question because it is rhetorical. Many things can be rhetorical. Rhetorical means persuasive. It's a persuasive question. The rhetorical triangle, therefore, is, guess what, a persuasive triangle. Like a triangle, it has three parts, and they're equally important. What are the three parts? Okay, the three parts are yourself, so why they should listen to you. That's called ethos, and it's to do with why they should trust you. And you could, for example, use your own personal experience, or you can pretend to be an expert. That's fine. You can lie. Yeah? You can make stuff up. It's not a real um, article. You, know? it's, you can make stuff up. So pretend to be an expert, if you want. Ethos. Why should we even listen to you? That's the first question the audience have got in mind when you're trying to persuade them. Why should I listen to what you have to say? Why should I even pay attention? And if you can't do that, they're not going to 
listen to you and, and the rest of it doesn't matter. The second thing you've got to do is use log logic, okay? Log logic called logos, which is like, why does it make sense? Okay, I'm listening, but does it make sense? So you could use facts, statistics, just logical reasoning to persuade them. The final part is pathos. The word pathetic um, originally did not mean being a loser. Pathetic meant being emotional. Uh, like sympathetic means you feel someone else's emotions. So pathos is to do with emotion. And the reader might think, okay, it makes sense, but do I really care that much? So you need to use pathos to make them care. So you can use rhetorical questions. Uh, you can use emotive language. You can involve the audience where you say we and make them feel connected to you. Many things you can do to create emotion. And if you use these in the right way, so generally, but it's not like you only do ethos at the start and then only logos. It's more like the first paragraph is going to be 50, 60% ethos. And then the middle section is going to be mostly logos. And the last section is 50 or 60% emotion. But you mix them up a bit. But you need to use all three to be persuasive. Okay, let's talk about literature a little bit. I've told you already a structure you can use for poetry, because very often you're comparing two poems, so we're going to use our P-E-T-E-T-E-R, P -E -T -E -T -E -R, where we mention evidence and techniques from both texts, and then explain them and link them back to the question. Also in poetry, here's a tip um, for both types of poetry. Okay, So actually start by reading the beginning and the end of the poem then the rest. Because if you do that, you're more likely to understand the poet's main message. What was the whole point of the poem? What are they even on about? What was the main thing they want to get across to you? You'll figure it out by reading the beginning and the end, because usually the most important and dramatic things happen in those two places. So that tip might change the way you read poems. Also, um, remember in this part, you might learn a load of fancy techniques. Anastrophe, uh, triplets, different kinds of rhyming scheme, iambic pentameter, if you know what that is, and don't worry if you don't. You might learn all this complex stuff, but you know you're not really going to get examined on it. Now, it's good to know it, but if you can't spot it, don't worry. You can still just talk about types of words, like I said earlier, nouns and verbs, etc. Also, even if you spot it, like you notice the poem is in trochaic tetrameter, which sounds really fancy, you notice that, you don't have to talk about it. And if you're not sure why, and you can't explain why the poet chose it, don't talk about it. A big mistake students make is they say, oh, I've noticed these complicated techniques. I'm going to get loads of marks for showing off that I know what trochaic tetrameter is. No, you don't get any marks for knowing what it is. You get marks for explaining the effect. In fact, you get more marks for explaining the effect of a verb, which is an easy technique, than just knowing what trochaic tetrameter is, but not its effect. So bear that in mind. Be careful. Right. Um, so poetry. Then we have other types of literature. Shakespeare, which is actually a kind of poetry. He wrote it in poetry uh, with a rhythm and sometimes a rhyme. And you might do Macbeth, you might do Romeo and Juliet. There are, other, are others as well, like A Merchant of Venice, but these are the most popular. And whatever one you're doing, really, the, the same things apply. You need to know some of the poetry techniques. You need to know how to write an essay, and you're going to use evaluation. So all of these three, actually, you're going to use evaluation methods. So evaluation is when you give both sides of an argument. So we go back up here. Um, Peter, you're going to use Peter. You're going to say why you agree, why you disagree, and then say your overall opinion about the question. So if they ask you, for example, how does Shakespeare present ambition in Macbeth? You could say, well, Shakespeare shows ambition is dangerous because it leads Macbeth to murder the king, and this has terrible consequences, uh, blah, 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 blah. Or you could say, on the other hand, Shakespeare sometimes presents ambition as more positive. Uh, Macduff's ambition to get revenge on Macbeth for killing his family actually leads him to uh, remove the tyrant from the throne of Scotland and restore justice, for example. So you get both sides and then you say which one's better. Now, in these questions, okay, Shakespeare or the 19th century novel or the modern text, the 19th century novel is the 1800s, right? And it might be A Christmas Carol. It might be Jekyll and Hyde, or there are others too that might come up, like uh, Jane Eyre or Pride and Prejudice, but you'll probably do one of these two. And the modern text, most of you do in Inspector Calls, maybe some of the others. Um, but in all of them, actually, what we have to do, we have to evaluate, right? We also have to use Peter, and we also have to use uh, context and themes. Okay, so context is what was happening at the time, because... 
Writers do not write books for no reason. They write them in some way to influence people um, and influence stuff that is happening in their society. So writers now have got opinions about stuff like COVID-19 or Boris Johnson or petrol prices, right? They've got opinions about this stuff. Writers in the past also had opinions. So what was happening at the time is important to understand. For example, in Macbeth, it's about the king, King Duncan, and Macbeth, one of his lords, uh, murders him and takes over the throne. Well, guess what happened just before Macbeth? You might know this. You might have heard of the gunpowder plot, or Guy Fawkes, and we have uh, Bonfire Night, the 5th of November, to celebrate the fact that he didn't manage to kill the king, but he tried to. He put a load of gunpowder under the Houses of Parliament to try to kill King James. So people were pretty worried about, you know, today we'd call it terrorism, right? Um, trying to blow something up. People, people were pretty worried that someone would try to kill the king. That's why Shakespeare wrote the play, to show people that, no, that's not a good idea. Don't kill the king. The king is chosen by God, and if you kill him, you're going against God. And terrible things will happen, just like they happen to Macbeth. Of course, you can argue the other opinion, that uh, he's not really in favour of the king, because guess what? Macbeth is a king, he becomes a king, and he's a terrible king, and an evil king, and causes all kinds of problems. So is he really saying that kings have too much power? That's up to you to decide. The point is that the writer has an opinion about stuff going on in their time. You need to know a bit about what that time was. You don't need to memorise loads of dates. It's not a history exam. You need to get the gist of it. What were the big things happening? And what did the writer seem to think about them? So you can properly understand what they're talking about. Themes are just big topics. Like ambition, like kingship, religion, science, the role of women. These are themes. And writers have got opinions on those that relate to the time they lived in. So in the 1800s, for example, the 19th century, because we're in the 21st century, that's the 2000s. So, for example... In A Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens, who wrote that book, had opinions about poverty. And Scrooge was there to try to make fun of opinions that Dickens didn't like. Scrooge says that if you're poor, you're lazy, and you should just starve to death or go to prison. And uh, many people at the time Dickens wrote that book really believed that, right? So he wrote the book to try to change their minds by showing them that they'd end up like Scrooge. Unhappy, miserable, lonely, and uh, generally an awful person. Until the ghosts change his mind. Or, for example, in the modern text, An Inspector Calls was written by J.B. Priestley in 1945, but set in 1912, to show people that they should support um, the idea of working together and helping the poor, and uh, what is called socialism, which comes from social, so working together. In socialism, people work together and are more equal, but the government has more power because it has to make them equal. And um, at the time, in 1945, socialism was increasing in power. And so the inspector in this play, who goes and visits the Burling family, who are rich, right? Um, and who don't treat the, the poor well, a bit like Scrooge, actually. They're quite similar. Um, they, the inspector visits them and, and he basically tells them about a girl who's died in, um, and he used to work, she used to work for Mr. Burling. And how they did things that eventually caused her death because they were so much more rich and powerful and didn't care about her. And so he wrote that book to show rich people that they had to change their attitudes, be more compassionate, a bit like Dickens wrote his Christmas Carol. Because Priestley had opinions about stuff that was happening and he, he thought the rise of socialism and working together was a good thing and he should encourage it more. So hopefully, right, this has been useful to understand that the most important techniques and methods we have to use for each of these questions. Now, um, if you want any more further advice, I do have a tuition course and I'm going to um, put the link in the uh, email and in the description of this video. So you can click underneath, go to um, jpwtutoring.com slash sign up to join the course. And we do have a three month guarantee uh, which means that if your son or daughter joins the course, but you don't see any improvement in three months, now they have to do the work, they have to actually come to all the lessons, do all the homework, and this has never happened, that someone has done that and not improved. But if you don't see any improvement after those three months and they do all those things, we give you your money back. So um, it's almost risk-free to join. Anyway, the link is going to be below the video and in the um, email and the description of the video too. So look out for that. And sign up when you're ready, and you can you can call as well. I'll put a number there you can call if you've got any questions. 
and hopefully I'll see you soon anyway because I'm going to send you another video um, going into a bit more detail about analysing language because it's actually the most important topic in English. So I'll see you soon and any questions you can reply to this email or call and um, yeah, hope it was helpful and uh, see you soon. Bye.